No, it really hasn't. I think uh, when you look at an approval rating for the president uh, around 40 percent, when you look at record levels of inflation and pretty high levels of interest rates, um, it, it really is something that you would think would be a very clear and definitive opportunity for Republicans to have that, that red wave that they've been talking about for, for many months now. But so far, it really has not proven out to be. I mean, on average, the U.S. president's political party in the first term loses 28 seats in the House of Representatives and four Senate seats or more. And what we're seeing right now is that's just not happening. If, if anything, this is the, the Democrats doing far better than they expected. Why do you think that has been the case? Is it the fact that Joe Biden just a week ago came out and really said democracy here was on the line? That's a great question. At the U.S. Study Center, we polled on this issue a little bit, and there's been other pollings on it as well. And democracy, it ranks pretty high, but the number one issue is still inflation. Um, but I think the combination of perhaps the social issues that people are feeling, um, so you have the concern around abortion and access to, to abortion, you have concern about democracy as well, you have concern about just the general direction of the country culturally. Um, you're seeing a lot of different factors that, that play in that for most of the U.S. summer a few months ago were favoring the Democrats. And then there was concern that it was flipping the other way. But at the end of the day, the, the Democrats came out and voted. And, and really, the, the impressive levels, levels of turnout really shows that there's a lot of passion in the uh, U.S. Uh, uh, amongst U.S. voters, and we're seeing the result of that in this midterm election. Mm. What well, What has also been a test has been for the Donald Trump candidates, many of them election deniers. How did they go broadly? Yeah, it looks like right now there are some 200 um, uh, so-called uh, uh, people who deny the, the 2020 election results who, who won uh, races, and that's, that's across state levels here um, throughout the country. Um, but I think it's important to note on something like this that it, this is not just one one party, right? Like, we, we should remember the, the percentage of, of Democrats that, that questioned the 2016 um, presidential election results, as well as Stacey Abrams in Georgia. But what was interesting in that is that, especially after 2016, the Democrats did not really question the, there, there was not a, a sizable amount of Democrats who questioned the vote in 2018 or, or afterwards. Um, whereas the, what we're seeing right now in 2020 is, and, and beyond, is more passion and a lot more passion for questioning the vote amongst Republicans. Um, so the, the question is, does this sort of election denial last or is it simply something that's a bit of a flash of the pan and then it'll go the way of perhaps like the Tea Party, which we don't hear about as much anymore? Yeah. But Trump also backed some very high-profile candidates. One, for example, was the celebrity Dr. Mehmet Oz. Now, he has really been defeated by a Democrat who is still recovering from a severe stroke. Yeah, it was a pretty remarkable defeat. So Dr. Oz, the celebrity doctor, um, he basically was parachuted in from New Jersey. He's not, he doesn't really have a lot of ties to Pennsylvania. And, um, and unsurprisingly, it didn't really resonate with uh, voters in Pennsylvania, despite the fact that there was a debate between um, the Fetterman, the lieutenant governor, and Dr. Oz. And, uh, doc and Fetterman was re recovering from a stroke, and it was very visible. And it really, he, he spoke haltingly, and it was, it was just uncomfortable for a lot of folks to watch. And even then, that was not enough for Dr. Oz to, to overcome that. So I think in, in many ways you could say that the Trump endorsement has, has not really been that successful in a number of places. You also can look at Arizona, for example, where, where Blake Masters is another Trump in, in, endorsed candidate and that did not fare nearly as well as uh, they had hoped. Yeah. What is this going to mean for his big announcement that is going to happen on November the 15th? Is it, you know, is it possible that uh, the Republican Party will look elsewhere for their candidate for the next election? That's a great question. Um, I, I think he is deliberately announcing it as soon as possible so that no one else is, is willing to announce amongst Republican presidential aspirants. Uh, right now, it really is just Donald Trump. But also, interestingly enough, it is Ron DeSantis in Florida. And Ron DeSantis arguably couldn't have had a better night um, in terms of his own reelection to, to governor in, in Florida. Um, he, 
he not only won again, he defeated a, a prior uh, governor of Florida, Charlie Chris, and he defeated him by a wider margin than Ron DeSantis won in 2018. And Ron DeSantis flipped uh, counties that Joe Biden won in 2020. So it really, I think, only increases the national profile of someone like Ron DeSantis, who in some polls is actually def um, uh, ranked a bit higher amongst Republicans than Donald Trump. So unsurprisingly, then, we saw Donald Trump take on Ron DeSantis just in the past week. And so he's calling Ron DeSantis Ron uh, de sanctimonious. He's talking. He, he's threatening basically to release um, um, uh, incriminating information about Ron DeSantis. And so, what was once a previously sort of simmering and, and uh, private uh, tension between the the two camps is now basically out in the open. Out in the open, indeed. What does this now mean for Joe Biden's agenda? Uh, if he, as likely, it, he lo they lose the House, the Democrats. Um, does everything stall again politically in the U.S.? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think right now you're coming off uh, two years where the Biden administration um, worked with the slim majority in Congress, and the Senate and the House of Representatives, to pass a wide range of legislation. I sincerely doubt we're going to see much legislation in, a, in the next two years, um, even if Democrats were to retain the Senate. It just takes a small majority of Republicans in the House of Representatives to basically stop domestic legislation. But what's important to note is that the U.S. Constitution really is 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 limits what a, a president can do domestically, but does not uh, in terms of foreign policy. So if you look at, for example, Bill Clinton, when he famously did pretty poorly in the 1994 midterm election, what did he do after that? He went overseas. So he, he uh, really engaged with Japan. He, he deepened and broadened the alliance with Japan. What did President Obama do in 20? 10, when he uh, faced what he called the shellacking by the Republicans, he negotiated the Trans-Pacific Partnership and, and engaged more on trade and international trade than he had before. So I think what we're going to, what we're likely to see in the, in the next two years from the Biden administration is a lot more foreign policy, probably more travel and just engaging on, on the international scene more than he did in the first two years. Yeah, that's an interesting point. Jared, always good to have you on. Thanks so much. Thank you.